this session we further discuss on uh, data and the classes usually in functional programming we use classes to encapsulate the data so in the last session i discuss how to create a class where we have data inside it and then we create several functions which works on top of this data so those functions usually works on top of the data within that class usually put it as methods so methods are subset of functions scala specially introduced a new type of class we call it as case classes to properly or efficiently handle the data and then we can use those case case classes to handle pattern matching and to perform different actions based on the data inside this class as you remember when you want to create a function when you want to create a class which has the data so we have to use a keyword class so in the last session we created a class for rational numbers as an example let's take another example in this way let's create a class to represent a point On a graph, so in the Cartesian graph, so you know we have x and y axis. So if you want to represent a point there, there are two integers need to be created. Those are x and y. So if you want to have a class called point, you can create that class something like that. So we create a class point which has two inputs that is x and y we call it then a and b and define two functions inside that class where it returns a and returns b when we call those so then within the point there are two then uh, functions which keep x and y coordinates so when you create a object of this class so you have to use a keyword called new, right? So we say new point and assign to a, some value or a variable. That's what we do with the regular classes. But if you do handle data in functional programming, instead of regular classes, we can create new type of class called case classes. In the case class, if you want to create an object of that, so we don't need a new keyword. It's similar to creating any data types. So if you want to create a value, we give a value and the an identifier and assign it using whatever integer what one. Similarly, case class can be used to create different uh, variables or values, which this time and the parameter of the case class always the value so we cannot put variables inside so they apply the value to the input parameter that means the data we input may not reflect back to the application so it's like pure function and when you create a case class it's automatically create few methods for us like two string Hash for equal methods for us. So we don't need to separately create them. So if you use regular classes, in case you want to print the data inside, we have to implement two string method. Or if you want to compare these two objects of the same class, we need to implement the methods called equals. So in case of case class, we don't need to do all these things. Everything is automatic. So, how do you then convert your regular class into the case class? Very simple. You put keyword case before 
creating a class. So here we create a case case class called point, which has a and b as input and two functions is n y returns a and b. So if this is a case class and want to create a point called p1, so we can say value p1 and create a point as x value one and y value two assigned to a p1. So similarly, we can create a point called p2 by putting four and five, and that point is assigned to p2. So you see there are no new keyword used here. So it created point called p1 and point called p2. In other words, it's created a new data type called point. This point has x and y. Similarly, as I mentioned, in the case class automatically create two string methods. That means if you just print the point P1 for debugging or whatever purpose, it's automatically printed, like you are printing a string or like you are printing an integer. So similarly, we create a point P1 and P2. You want to see the values of P1, this X and Y coordinates, you just call print and P1. So that prints the content of this case class. So you don't need to implement two string methods to do so. You just print for print ln with the variable or the object name. So then it prints. The other advantage is we can compare those. It's equal method. So you see there is a two points, P1 and P2 created. So point one is this, point two is this. So you can hold P1 equal P2. So you can compare whether point P1 is equal to point P2. So in this example, so P1 is P2 and not equal. So this uh, expression is evaluated to false. So if these two points are same, so it will return true. So like you can compare case class objects just as you are comparing other type, data types. In addition to that, case class has a copy method. So you using, using this copy method, you can make a copy of that class object. So for example, if you have point called P1 and you want to make copy, you can call P1.copy. It returns a copy of the same object. So if you want, you can partially copy the object as well. So there you say P1 copy and give the new value. The the value we are not given is automatically copied. So for example, if you call this statement, it creates a point called P3 as x value 4. And since B by value is given separately, so it creates a point called 4, 9. Most important part of case classes are is a case classes are matching. So if you want to kind of execute different actions based on the values available on those points, object, you can directly do so. So for example, here we are creating a point called P1 and then we create an anonymous function called P type, which take a point as input parameter, transform, to this case statement. What this case statement do? So we take a point P match to different options. So if that point P match into the zero zero, we call point origin. So if it match to any point and the Y axis is zero, then our point is on the X axis, right? So if the X value is zero, the Y value basically any y values, we can say point on the y axis. So if you say point x, y, so it just prints 
if whether x is equal or greater than x and y and things like that. So this is just an example. So as if we have such case statement. So then what's happened? When we input a point to this anonymous function for p type, this p value put it into a different pattern matching or so different matching statements. So based on those matching, so we could coordinate or we can execute different actions. So in this example, point one zero and call p type p1 with that point p1. So it comes here and the y axis is zero. So then it match with this and print that on the terminal. So as a summary, case class create a encoded data objects where we can pass in between functions. Case class are like normal classes. Only difference is we use case keyword before the class keyword when we define it. So for example, we are creating a new data type called closed clock type, which has two inputs, that is hours and minutes as a case class. So if you want to create such case class or object as such new object, so you only need this bold line, say case class clock time and its parameters. So if you do so, you can create a value of this time t1 or t2 or whatever by calling this object like here. Clock 1210 will create a time called t1. So if you want to print the content, so you call print and let straightforward. So we don't need the new keyword here. And we don't need to implement two string methods. So if you have two times called T1 and Q2, we can compare them together as well. The most importantly, we can use pattern matching. That means we can use time and match it to the different cases and take different actions based on those matching. So for example, so I create an a anonymous function called print which take one input and input is uh, clock time. The data, data type for this is clock time. Clock time is our own created new data type. And if that time matches these cases, we do these actions. So what are the cases? We say first case clock time match to 1830. We say this is sunset time. So the second place is clock time match to six hours and zero minutes. So we say the six hour, whatever, sunrise time. So similarly, we say clock time match to 10 hours and underscore means anything, any other means anything, we say 10, 10 o'clock or 10 10 o'clock. So if just case underscore means anything else, we just print time. So basically we, we call such print method here, which we define in this function. So, and pass the time T1. So it's match case from the beginning to the end. It's first match, it's used the first match policy. So if that matches to here, it's executed with that and stop. So, so we can create new data types and then those data types we can pass into the match case statements and based on the, the content of that data, we could execute different operations or the actions on top of this case class. So that's why the case classes are important. Usually when you want to create a new data structure in a functional programming language. So creating these new data structures, usually we use the technique 
which we call it as case classes. Case classes kind of collect or kind of encapsulate new data time, data into a one object. So if you want, we can add methods to those case classes as well. So with that, I kind of conclude the fundamental things of functional programming, fundamental stuff of the functional programming. So as a final remark, I want to highlight this. So this is the latest survey conducted by the Stack Overflow that is kind of well-known programming or programmers website called Stack Overflow. So according to their latest finding, the highest paid job in the world hold by the functional programmers. So if you want to go get a high salaries in the industry at the end of a degree program, you must know functional programming. I have to highlight it as a motivation to follow these lectures, also as a motivation to learn functional programming. So you, you, this is statistics for US. It's similar to worldwide as well. In the US, usually Scala programmer takes annually $143,000. It's roughly rupees 2 million per month, 2 million per month. It's a very high salary. So in the second highest demand comes with Clojo. It's a new functional programming language. So the Scala and Clojo both works on top of a Java VM. Clojo follows a style like Lips, so kind of first generation functional programming language called Lips. So Scrooge follows that, and it also has a highest demand. So as you might see, top two highest demanding salary job in the world market all by functional program. So at present, there is a very huge demand for the functional programs. So comparing to the traditional programmers, so like structured and object-oriented programs. So object-oriented and structured programmers can be fine very easy, but functional programmers are very less in the world. So because, so we neglect functional programming a few years ago in academic curriculums. So we have added functional programming to our UCSC curriculum recently. And this is the second time we are running this functional programming course for our undergraduate. So after kind of two, three years, so we are producing the undergraduate with functional programming skills. So I believe they will get very good jobs with very high salaries. So in case you manage to move to US, so that is kind of two million per month. Like high seller. So think about that. Learn hard and follow those lectures and learn how to do functional programming. Right? I use Scala only to teach you this functional thinking, but what you have to know, there are several other functional programs like Kojo, Erler, and so on. So if you understand the fundamental stuff of functional programming, like pure functions, recursive functions, high order functions, or what you call it as anonymous functions, and map, reduce, filter, kind of abstract abstractions, which uses in the functional programming, you are done. So that's conclude this lecture series. So 
the rest of the lectures might be based on the frameworks. So there are several uh, uh, frameworks have developed to use these functional programming styles. So for example, if you want to develop web applications, there is a Scala framework, which uh, everybody use called Play Framework. And when you want to do concurrent programming, so there is a framework called Actor. So Actor programming, or actor-based model is a different thinking pattern or different thinking model we use to develop concurrent programming in the functional style. So like that, several frameworks, interesting frameworks available in the world to use in high-end applications. So I'll create a video later on in this week and give you an introduction to actor framework, actor-based programming model. So that is really interesting in case you develop distributed, decentralized, or what we call it as concurrent applications. Thank you for listening. So we'll do a demo in a separate video.